Hello. Welcome to the continuation of the Engineering and Construction webinar series from the United States Corps Army Corps of Engineers. Today's presentation is Managing the Risk of Innovation. Post-occupancy measurement and verification is to obtain metered performance data from operational projects and compare the results to the design expectations to see how the two line up. This discussion will detail how this process was integrated into the Federal Center South Project, which is the home of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Seattle District Headquarters. There will be a Q&A period at the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our uh, unlisted YouTube channel. Uh, next slide, please. Usually it takes a couple weeks for processing and editing, and it will be made available also via link from the Sustainability and Energy uh, Portal website, the address being at the, the top on the screen there. If you'd like to earn CEUs for attending five of our web so webinars as a group, you can download a quiz on the above website, answer the questions, and email it to s underscore e webinar at usys.army.mil, uh, address at the bottom of the screen, along with your AI number if you have one, uh, to receive credit. Our presenter today is Charles Chaliochip. He holds professional engineering licenses in both civil and mechanical engineering. He has worked on projects around the world and believes that high performance is, the, is best achieved through simple, thoughtful solutions that drive down energy and water usage while improving occupant comfort and connectivity. Also joining us later in the Q&A uh, discussion at the end will be Nathan Gregory from our own Seattle district. With that, I will now turn it over to Charles. Good morning. Afternoon, maybe evening for some of you. Uh, my name is Charles Chaloycheep, but please uh, just call me Charles. I've worked with WSP since 2008 as a mechanical engineer, and my goal every day here is to determine how we can best design our systems to minimize the impact on the environment, whether it be through energy efficiency, reduced water consumption, or a more productive indoor environment. And today, I want to share the story of Federal Center South. Now, this project is very near and dear to my heart. I worked on it from concept design all the way through uh, the first year of operation, or a little bit past the first year of operation. And uh, I worked with ZGF Architects and Selen Construction. They were the design build contractors who won this um, contract under a competition. So the project is $72 million. Uh, design build project and was funded by the Federal Recovery Act. It's a 200,000 square foot office building for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Seattle, Washington. So the, it's a LEED Platinum project. Originally it was targeting LEED Gold, but we were able to push it to LEED Platinum. It won numerous awards. Um, some that I'm very proud of are the AIA uh, Committee on the Environment Top 10, uh, Green Project in 2013, and AIA uh, Committee on the Environment Plus, um, in, it won that in 2015. So the difference is um, one is a design award and one is an operation award. So after we proved its performance, we won um, the AIA Code Plus. And there's only one building per year that wins that, so that's amazing. But really today, I want to tell the story of how uh, the designers were able to push innovation with you know, a, right, a rightfully cautious client and we were able to prove operational performance. So the project is located uh, just south of uh, greater downtown Seattle, Washington, between um, downtown and the airport. It was a redevelopment of an old warehouse site and is right along the Duwamish River in somewhat of an industrial area, a lot of port type activities in this area. The goals of the project were many, um, but today I'm really going to focus on the energy goal and what a lot of people in the industry are measuring buildings or the metric that they use for buildings is EUI, energy use intensity, right? And the metric or the, the value that we use for that is uh, KBTUs per square foot per year, so 1,000 BTUs per square foot per year, and the competition set out a target of uh, 26 KBTU per square foot per year, or 
kilowatt hours per square foot per year, depending on um, what type of units you like to see. So energy is really hard to get your head around. So let's try and figure out what that type of target means in reference or in relation to other buildings. So here's a slide um, from the Seattle 2030 district, and hopefully you can see it okay. But what the Seattle 2030 district did was they took a survey of all different types of buildings, warehouses um, are on the lower end, and hospitals and supermarkets are on the higher end. And, you know, somewhere near the middle is offices. And they found it to be, I think that says 59.7. So 59.7 EUI, or almost double, or, you know, more than double what our target was for this project. And, in fact, our project was... Our target was closer to a warehouse um, median use, and that's that's kind of fitting given that um, it is a warehouse redevelopment. So currently, I am in the um, Honolulu office, and here in Honolulu, the local utility did a survey of all of the uh, office buildings in downtown, and here is their EUI in kilowatt hours per square foot per year. So our um, 7.6 kilowatt hour per square foot per year target doesn't even register on the actual metered data. That's what I like about this graph is it's, it's actual metered data. It's, and we're, we would be way down here. Eh, you know, it's a different climate, so maybe that's not fair. But I just wanted to get everybody's heads around what this target means. And then here's um, something I pulled from the EIA website, which shows federal buildings and their uh, delivered EUI. So this is, again, KBTU per square foot per year. And, you know, they're in the high, close to 100s or, or um, even up to 136. And that's also, you know, maybe a little bit unfair. Yeah, it's a federal building, but we don't really know exactly what's going on in those in these buildings or where they're located. But, again... Just trying to give a little bit of, of context to what this target means. So let's take ourselves back to the competition phase. And what were some of the strategies that maybe could work for this building to hit a uh, low energy use intensity? So, you know, a lot of times you think of high performance buildings, especially in Seattle, you think, oh, you know, given the mild climate, maybe we should consider natural ventilation. Well, the challenge with natural ventilation uh, was the air quality in the area. It wasn't that great. Um, it's, it's an industrial area, so there was a lot of um, particulates in the air that we didn't want to bring into the office space. And there was also some security concerns with having operable openings on the facade. Another opportunity was the Duwamish River that was right next to the site. And we were thinking, oh, maybe we can use the river for heat rejection. But we only had six weeks for a competition, and that wasn't really enough to vet that solution through um, the environmental agencies that would approve that type of thing. So the architect came up with numerous building shapes and orientations, and we tried to guide the architect through, we try to guide the architect into system selection by helping them understand uh, what type of orientations enable different mechanical systems and what type of facade treatments enable different systems. You know, we looked at um, triple glazing. Uh, we looked at a high-performance glass. And what we found was, you know, really a, a high-performance glass with uh, perimeter radiators and an underfloor air supply was going to be our best solution. So here's kind of the general concept that we went into the competition with. We have an underfloor air supplied to the space for breathing, ventilation. We had chilled beams, uh, passive chilled beams in the space for cooling, and then at the perimeters we had uh, radiant heaters that you saw with the high-performance glass that enabled this system. And when we submitted this, we got some pushback. 
uh, from the GSA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because they had some challenges with underfloor on other projects. Um, this is somewhat unlike other projects because it is a DOAS underfloor system rather than a more VAV type underfloor system, variable air volume uh, versus a dedicated outside air. So the amount of fresh air that we're providing is, is minimal. But to, to help quell the concerns, we did some CFD studies. You know, we really tried to prototype our design early on to give everybody uh, an understanding of how the system would work. Uh, and the chilled sails were actually a, a special design just for this project. We knew they were going to be exposed, so we wanted to make sure they were going to look great. And so we worked with the manufacturer to design these chilled sails, and we went to the manufacturing facility to be sure they were going to work. You know, we even all cut our hair very short so that we could be sure that it would uh, feel very much like the U.S. Army Corps staff and make sure everybody would be comfortable. We ran numerous tests. They had a test chamber. Um, and by the end of the meeting, you know, Dwayne Allen, the, the GSA representative, was able to, or confident enough, to testify before Congress that this system would work for the building. So we didn't, we didn't stop there. You know, we, we prototyped the design um, in, in computer modeling. We went to the factory to look at the mock-ups. And then we did a mock-up in the field. And this is sort of how it looks. We have our chilled sails or chilled beams on the, uh, exposed on the roof or on the ceiling. Um, High performance glass at about you know 50 to 60 percent along the perimeter, our radiant heaters, and then an underfloor um, supply air system. But really, you know, I could focus on everything that's going on inside the building, but that's kind of focusing on um, the dashboard in a car and not really focusing on the engine. And what we found was. When we have this, these chilled beams, what we've really done is, is decoupled the air systems from the heating and cooling systems. And we're using a higher temperature cooling water to, to do this work. And you notice when we compare the chilled beam loads and the heating loads across the year that there's a lot of overlap. And we wondered if there was a way to capture some of the heat or cool and reuse it throughout each day. Enter the uh, thermal battery, thermal storage that we came up with. And this is a, a phase change material that's in a tank on top of the building. And what it does is in the morning when we heat the building, um, the cool that is, that is generated from the heating, uh, one side is heating and the other side has to find some source of that heat, pulls it from the PCMs and, and ends up freezing the PCM, ends up changing the phase of the uh, phase change material. And then later in the day, we're able to uh, run water through those uh, phase change material and cool it off and run it through the chill beam systems, acting as a thermal battery throughout each day. So there was also so a number of betterments that we carried for the site, and one of those was a ground loop. And early on, we found that the ground loop was going to be too expensive uh, during competition. But as we went forward, we recognized that there's an opportunity with the structural design to incorporate a ground loop into the structural piles. So we ran. Um, water loops through 200 of the piles that were driven about 150 feet deep each to supplement our um, phase change material system and act as another source of another heat source and a source of heat rejection. So, so kind of culminating in the final design that we uh, prototyped with software uh, that we 
checked in with the supplier and tested at lab, at lab facilities. And then we also did a, a mock-up in the field as well as integrated some betterments in. We have 100% um, fresh air coming in and being supplied in an underfloor system. The air then heats up and, and um, ventilates the space while the chilled beams offer cooling or the radiant heaters offer heating. Um, as the air makes it, its way through the space, it naturally moves through the atrium and out of the building. Um, in the central plant, we have our ground loop and our phase change material, both uh, act as sources of heat and heat rejection uh, when they're coupled with our heat recovery chillers. We also have a rainwater tank, um, but I'm focusing more on the energy side of the story today. You know, so that's all great. Um, but the biggest or maybe the most interesting piece of this contract, in my mind, is the performance guarantee. So during the competition, we came in with a 27 uh, kBTU per square foot per year, and we guaranteed that performance within the first year of operation. So the Army Corps and the GSA said, great, you guys are doing some interesting things. As long as it works, you know, it doesn't matter because you guys are on the hook for 0.5% of your construction contract, which equals about uh, $375,000. So, you know, this is not a, a small amount of money that, that we wanted to throw away. You know, we definitely wanted to manage the building system and how it operated. So that's, that's the next piece of this presentation. You know, how did this beautiful building end up operating. And I kind of wanted to play a game with everybody. So it's going to be a little bit challenging because we're not all in the same room. But what this game is, is trying to figure out how much energy our different appliances use in our homes. And what I want you guys to do is type in the top two energy consumers. So you get two votes. Don't do it yet, but you get two votes. And this is my house uh, in San Francisco where I was living at the time. And I have my TV. I have my refrigerator. Okay. I have my gas water heater. I have my gas furnace, my uh, clock radio slash um, phone charger, and my washer and dryer. So there's six different pieces of equipment. And I want you guys to take some time, ask me some questions, um, and try and rank the top two. So if you think that the TV and the refrigerator are the top two usage, just type in the chat window, TV and refrigerator. But before you do that, let's take you know maybe three minutes to think about it and ask any questions here. Um, let's see. One question that's typical when I, when I uh, have given this presentation in the past is, how much TV do I watch? Do, uh, and I don't watch that much. Um, my wife watches a bit more than I do. At the time, it was just me and my wife uh, in the house. Uh, and it's about, okay, good. So I, I, don't have any, I didn't have any kids at the time of this survey. So there's only two people in the house, two bedroom house, one bathroom, um, San Francisco, the Energy Star, there are Ener these are all Energy Star rated. Uh, the dryer is gas. These are all very good questions. Um, I watch about, we'll say two hours, no, one hour of TV per day average. Uh, we each take one shower per day. Uh, we heat the house in the winter, which tends to be a little bit longer than, you know, three to four months in San Francisco. So maybe we'll say we heat the house for five months. Um, the washer and dryer we do maybe, um, we'll say three loads a week, two of those on cold and one of those on hot. Um, and we hang dry. We'll say we hang dry all the clothes. Uh, we're going to just do pure energy. Um, so one of the, so there's a couple questions. One of, one of them was there Energy Star appliances? Do I have any kids? Is the dryer uh, gas? And uh, is the energy used by cost or by BTU? And it's going to be straight energy. Okay. 
So I have one one dryer load um, per week, and um, three. Okay, good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So start pouring in. Um, start pouring in some answers here. We have water heater and dryer uh, is looking good. You guys start ty typing in refrigerator is up there. The TV is a is like a LCD TV. So we have a furnace and hot water. I'm not going to name anybody's name uh, when you guys put in your guess, so don't worry. It's not recorded, and uh, I'm just going to say the survey uh, results here. Okay, we'll give it. We'll give it one more minute here to, to ponder if you guys have any more questions. But right now, it's looking like the water heater, the fridge, and the furnace are up there. Um, we have we have one dryer, and then the TV. Okay. <laughs> so I don't have any kids in this one, but uh, yeah, there's definitely a bit of variation if I did. Um, we we do more um, laundry now than we ever have. We have a six-month-old now. So okay, so let's let's see if we can get a consensus here. We'll go with um, maybe water heater one. Uh, Let's see what else we have. Water heater, um, furnace, no, water heater, sorry, water heater laundry as two, furnace as three, and fridge as four. Okay, there's a couple TVs out there, so we'll put TV as five, and then there was one clock radio, I think. Okay, so this is, uh, let's, let's see now if we can figure out what um, uses the most energy based on my electricity bills, which is basically the state that most of our buildings are in. We have our gas bill and we have our electricity bill, and that's all we can tell um, to determine who or what is using energy. So here's my uh, annual bill in San Francisco, PG&E. Uh, provides some feedback and this is the electricity usage and you know what what do we see here really you know we see a base load of maybe 60 kilowatt hours yeah we'll say that um, electricity doesn't tend to fluctuate too much across the year probably because I don't have air conditioning we don't need air conditioning in San Francisco it starts to creep up you know, towards the winter, but then there's a big drop in December, um, which is likely an indication of when I went on vacation uh, or, or, you know, uh, Christmas holidays. Okay, so that's good. Am I able to tell if the clock radio uses more than the refrigerator or uses more than the TV? Uh, no, I can't tell in this or if it's the lighting that wasn't even one of the the um, options can't really tell okay let's compare it to the gas bill so a couple interesting things one the climate in San Francisco is pretty flat throughout the year very flat um, in terms of average temperature I do have a much larger gas use in the winter months right like I was saying, about five months a year, maybe November, December, January, February, March, and even into April, we're using heating, right? That's that's kind of an indication of heating. Uh, anybody want a survey to guess what's going on below this curve? I know it's hard. You all have to type in. But this is um, indicative of our water heater and our laundry, right? 
So what uses more, my furnace or the water heater and laundry, right? So it looks like I have about a 20, maybe a 20 um, therm, this is in therms, a 20 therm base load for hot water and the, the dryer, right? And then I have a, another 20 or so for my heating at its peak. So yeah, I think water water heater is bit bigger than oh sorry yeah water heater is bigger than um, my furnace right but I don't really know if that's water heater for the dish for the for the laundry or for my showers. Now who can tell me what uses more or what is more twenty therms of gas or my sixty kilowatt hours of electricity. How many therms are in a kilowatt hour, right? So that's a challenge. We get these bills, we get they're all in different um, units and 20 therms is actually 600 uh, kilowatt hours. So now we know that my gas usage for the hot water and for the furnace and for the dryer, uh, washer and dryer, is much higher than the fridge or the TV or the clock radio combined, right? So we know that gas usage is my biggest um, concern and that maybe electricity usage isn't as bad. So what's the next step? What do I do next? Well, I, uh, I, I went on vacation right like i like you saw in december and i unplugged everything in the house except for the refrigerator to try and get a feel for what that refrigerator's energy usage is right and it's very very small right the refrigerator uses almost no energy now i didn't have any kids leaving the refrigerator door open and you know i wasn't even there to open anything and there so maybe that's not a a clear data point or a fair data point, but it just gives an indication of what the refrigerator might be using for most of the day, and it's really small, right? Nowhere close to what the furnace and the water heater is doing. Next thing I do is look at an hourly uh, electricity usage in my home, and you can see, you know, I get, I get, I wake up 6 a.m., I turn on some lights, you know, brush my teeth, whatnot, get ready for work, then I, I go into work, um, get home 6 or 7 p.m., all the lights, all the TV, you know, probably charging my phone, all of that comes on. Again, I don't have too much information on what piece of equipment is using how much energy, but I do, I still can see that it's nowhere close to the gas. So, you know, what was the answer to the game? I guess the answer is we know it's going to be the hot water and the furnace, and we don't really know too much besides that. We don't know if that hot water is being used for showers or being used for um, laundry, and we don't know if the gas is being used for the dryer or the furnace, really. So that's a little bit too bad. You know, that, that's kind of where we, where we are today. We don't know too much. We can kind of get an idea of what our biggest issues are, but we don't really know how we can change them. And we don't really know how we're doing unless we compare ourselves to other homes or other people in the neighborhood or other buildings in similar climates. And so here is my electricity usage uh, in blue versus an efficient home in green versus all similar homes, right? So I'm just crushing it. I'm feeling great. You know, I don't I don't use any electricity, which in San Francisco is actually a very low emissions um, fuel source because there's a lot of uh, hydro power in San Francisco. And then I shift to my uh, gas usage, and uh, and here, here my story isn't as rosy, you know. I'm either taking way more showers than my neighbors, uh, I'm either doing way more laundry than my neighbors, or I'm heating my house and not uh, and it and it needs 
you know, better insulation or my boiler is just really, or, you know, my furnace is really um, a low efficiency, right? And the challenge with this is this is a typical street in my neighborhood where we have very new buildings with high insulations and brand new equipment versus older buildings that are probably leaking like a sieve and probably have uh, mechanical systems that are over 50 years old. So how is that a really a fair comparison? And, and how do we tackle this question when we get into uh, design or even act after operation of a building? How do we figure out what equipment is using the most amount of energy, right? Well, one thing we do is we build an energy model, which is what we did for Federal Center South. And we say, okay, this energy model tells me that HVAC uses 25% and lighting uses 25% and plug loads use 25% and then there's 25% of miscellaneous something else, data center or something. But the challenge with energy modeling is, um, this is a graph by the New Buildings Institute uh, from the Pacific Northwest. And they say, look, here's all of these lead buildings, right? And they all have a design EUI of, say, we'll pick ones with a design EUI of 30, which is where we were uh, in the neighborhood of during our competition. But in actual operation, their EUI is much higher than 30, sometimes double, you know, sometimes close to triple what, what the, the energy model said. So there isn't always a great... Um, great correlation between energy model and actual operation. So what did we do for Federal Center South? Well, we put meters everywhere so that we can figure out how much energy, you know, lighting systems or different systems are using. And I thought to myself, well, we're going to be the David Hasselhoff building operators here. You know, we're going to drive this kit car and know exactly how much energy everything is using. I can play any energy game anybody wants and I can tell you exactly how much um, KWH or therms anybody is using. Well, what came back was a whole bunch of data points from the BMS system. Uh, that was a, a pretty big hurdle to dig through. And you know, part of that story is to say, yeah, we need metering but we also need a metering strategy and a way to digest this metering. What we had to do uh, for all of this data was we had to build our own Excel calculators. And some of the output from the Excel calculators um, is this graphic. You know, this is the lighting output from our Excel calculator. And what you see here is we have our orange, which is the modeled lighting, right? And then our blue, which is the metered lighting. And what do we see here? We have a big gap between the base load, right? 20 kilowatts versus, say, 5 kilowatts uh, at the lighting. So anybody want to guess what maybe the, the issues might be there? Or anybody want to um, make any comments about what else we're seeing on this? Uh, on the, in this data, always a challenge when we have uh, just to type in. But here's a few things we saw. You know, Martin Luther King Day, the system wasn't quite geared up to handle that, so maybe the vacation schedule wasn't um, wasn't quite in the lighting system. So we added that. Same with uh, New Year's Day, January 1st. We also noticed that the peak lighting loads were slightly less than the modeled lighting load. So that's that's good. Um, maybe that can be attributed to the daylight sensors uh, operating properly versus our modeled um, system without daylighting. But what is this delta between the base load here? Well, what we found was even though we did a good job of trying to submeter all of the circuits or all of the panels, I should say, sometimes there was equipment on the panel that wasn't um, that wasn't lighting. So somebody asked if we included some of the 24/7 lights being left on, and yes, we did. And uh, that was a pretty minimal amount of lighting. Um, that big delta right there is basically HVAC equipment or plug load equipment 
that was placed on a lighting panel um, with a lighting meter. So we called them polluted circuits or polluted panels. And to get to the bottom of that, all we did was um, a couple nights, or actually just one night, we turned off all the lights in the building from, say, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. and figured out what other equipment might be on um, the lighting circuits. And we uh, adjusted for that in our measurement and verification process. So now, here's the plug loads. Um, and the plug loads, you know, the designer doesn't really have too much control of the plug loads. And again, we have our orange, which represents our modeled. And then the blue, which represents uh, some of the base load. And then there's some red in there where um, data was missing. So that, that don't pay too much attention to the red. And you just see a, a tremendous delta here between um, the base at 20 kW versus 40, right? Really dwarfing the lighting. And then we also see a bump right here in January. So, you know, what was some of that? those issues? Well, one of those issues was um, the U.S. Army Corps in Seattle, they brought over some of their legacy servers uh, from their old install into the new, from their old office into the new um, building. So that was a little bit of a bump there. And then another thing was, was during the design, we said, you guys need to shut down all your computers at night. And what we found out was that the IT services had um, patch upgrades for, um, for computers that required them to be in an in a on mode rather than even a standby mode. So we, we think that a lot of that was due to computers just being left on, and it wasn't because uh, the U.S. Army Corps you know, employees didn't care about the environment, but um, there was some security issues that IT uh, required required computers to be left on. And I think a lot of this has, has actually changed because we did uh, notify the U.S. Army Corps about this policy and talk to the IT group and tried to figure out ways to help this uh, decline. So here's kind of the overall story, right? In January, we had our main meter right here, and we had to make some adjustments to figure out what it looks like against our target, right? And our adjustments include um, the overage and plug loads, um, some heating and cooling. Um, this was during kind of move in or settling in. And so there was a lot of 24-7 um, operation of the HVAC system that wasn't included in the model and really didn't need to, wasn't fair to, uh, attribute against the design team in terms of their performance contract. So then we had an adjusted total. So this is kind of like a normalized total based on um, what we designed the building to. But then here's the target, and here's the model, right? So it's, it's still over the target and way over the model. And what you notice is our target is actually greater than our model because um, even, you know, the design team knew that models aren't perfect and we wanted to build in a little bit of fat into the system. So the first thing we looked at uh, for the first three months was the plug load and lighting. We got that pretty well dialed in, um, but there was still a lot of heating and cooling overages and a little bit of domestic water. Interior lighting was better and elevators, which are always um, tough to estimate, that, that did really well because I, I like to think it's because there's a lot of stairs in the um, space. Uh, one of the questions was, what watts per square foot does this correspond to? So the answer to that question is um, the plug loads that we modeled uh, in terms of a watt per square foot was based on a survey that we did of the existing U.S. Army Corps um, facility. And it was somewhere between 0.5 watts per square foot and 0.7 watts per square foot. So pretty standard um, plug load across the board. And then we added um, the the wattage of the servers that we saw from our from our um, plug load survey. So that's a great question. So for the second quarter, we started really focusing in on the HVAC systems. We made changes, the, the PCM system, the phase change material system that I talked about, you know, it wasn't working like we planned it. The phase change material capacity that the manufacturer um, stated wasn't it wasn't finding the capacity that was stated in the specs. Luckily, we had our ground loop, and and the ground loop um, 
really helped out, and it was operating amazingly uh, in terms of its ability to recharge itself. And I like to think that that's because of its um, adjacency to the Duwamish River. Another question that came up was, what was the measured plug load power density? Yeah, so, oh, I see what you're saying. So, you know, I would say it was double, right? If you look at the, the graph, um, I don't know if I can go back to it because it, there's a little bit of latency, but our, our plug loads uh, in the model were about half of what the plug loads were. So it's closer to, say, one, one watt per square foot, we can say. Um, I have the reports, and I could dig back and, and figure that out. But just off the top of my head, I would say it's closer to one watt per square foot. And that's just in the, in the um, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. The measured plug load power density was actually close to the 0.5 watts per square foot or 0.75 watts per square foot. What really killed us was the schedule, the profile of that 0.5 or 0.7 watts per square foot. It was on much more often. The turn down overnight was to 50%, whereas in our energy model, uh, we turned it down to, say, 15%. So it wasn't, we weren't really far off on the plug load density. We were, we were more off on the, um, on the turn down. So you can see here, you know, this base up. This is only 60 up to 110, so that's 50 kW. And from 20 up to 70, that's also 50 kW. So that, that uh, kW per square foot or watts per square foot is pretty close. Great question. Um, sorry, back to the um, second quarter and, and, and into the third quarter. We really made these adjustments to the system. We maximized water side economizer. Uh, relied on the ground loop a bit more. And at the end of the day, you know, we really started dialing it in where our metered energy was very close to the target. And after we adjusted for plug loads, our, our normalized total was pretty close, you know, almost spot on with the model. And that's, you know, a pretty outstanding result. It took a lot of work. Uh, by the building operations team, a lot of coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the design team being involved. And this sort of design, build, operate model is something that I'm very excited about. You know, the, the interesting piece is that the operator of this building for the first year of uh, operations was actually the mechanical contractor because there were some challenges finding an operator for the building. So the mechanical contractor um, stepped in for the first year which, you know, was nice to have somebody operating the building who had uh, also a carrot or a stick in terms of the retention, the 0.5% retention. So at the end of the day, you know, we, we weren't doing so great. This, this black line is the target. This gray line is the modeled. And we weren't doing so great first quarter. We made some changes. Uh, we started seeing significant savings, um, quarter two, quarter three. Quarter four, our cooling tower um, broke. Uh, there, there was um, an issue with the cooling tower, and that caused us to, to have a, a bust in energy that month. But regardless, we still hit our target. Um, we got our retention. Everybody was happy. Everybody can be proud to say that not only is this building you know, designed to be lead platinum, in terms of energy, it also operates um, at a very, very efficient um, level. And it really was all because of this contractual requirement that the US Army Corps and the GSA integrated into the contract. So what does this really mean? You know, it, I think that it's hard to say you need to hit this EUI because there's a lot of different things that go into an EUI and there's a lot of different responsibilities. But we're seeing a lot of net zero buildings, and we're starting to see code compliance or code, re code requirement for net zero. And once that happens, um, you know, measurement and verification is almost going to be required because if I'm a building owner and I pay a designer to give me a net zero building, and at the end of the year, my energy usage doesn't sum up to zero or my energy bill is not close to zero, you know, I'm going to have some questions. 
And if we don't have the right metering or the right approach, the design team isn't going to have an answer. You know, and here's just a comparison of what the cost was versus, um, you know, the, the upfront cost versus the operating cost. And this is a facility in Seattle, about a 700,000 square foot office. And what we were saying is that um, to add metering and to add some advanced commissioning um, and to add some integration software, it was going to be a premium of, you know, half, half, half a million, $500,000, right? Uh, sorry, 250 versus 760. So it's a half a million dollar uh, increase in construction cost. But we think that we'll save at least 3% of operating energy, right? And if we really went the full Monty, we can save 7% uh, if we included some further advanced metering um, and, and really dialed in some of the the controls and um, the digestion software of all that data. And really the payback is almost immediate, within a year, year and a half. And we found that to be true um, for Federal Center South, at least with respect to our fees for the measurement and verification process. You know, we were able to save them, I forget the exact numbers, I want to say it was around $2,000 a month um, just, in the, just in the first couple months and after that we saved even more so it's a great story in the end and you know I, I really appreciate and respect the GSA and the US Army Corps forward thinking in terms of just driving the market with a financial mechanism rather than um, forcing them to use a certain technology so thank you very much again for having me today uh, you guys asked some great questions, and if you guys have any additional questions, I'm happy to stay on the line. I'll type in my email address here so you guys can see how you spell my last name. And if something comes up later, you can always send me an email with your question. All right, thank you, Charles. Um, folks, as you're already familiar with the text box in the lower right-hand corner, uh, several of you have been already using that. Uh, this is Eric again. Uh, please type your questions, your additional questions in there. The uh, chat window is not captured on the video recording, so for the sake of the recording, I will read the questions aloud, and uh, Charles will answer them. And uh, and basically, I may skip over some questions, come back to them, trying to con consolidate things that are the similar train of thought, uh, or I might skip over something that might not be as applicable. Um, you know, if it's a core specific question or something like that, we might be able to follow up uh, in house later. Um, so anyway, uh, I think most of these questions were answered uh, as far as the, uh, the plug load density and the, uh, is there a program uh, for uh, monitoring and comparing the model to the uh, the data now that the contractor is, is gone uh, for the long, long haul? Yeah, so um, there are programs out there to still measure and verify the, the process. One is called SkySpark. Um, IBIS is another one. This project didn't have of those. They were sort of burgeoning technologies during the design phase, um, and now they're more developed. So in the future, we would definitely integrate those types of solution. Um, right now, you know, the building operator is, is, uh, is still watching the building, but doesn't have that level of clarity. We're happy to share our Excel calculator with them, but it's not very, very plug and play. I mean, the good news is um, about two years after the operation of the building, so a year after we stopped monitoring the building, um, I had a dinner with Selen Construction, the uh, university mechanical contractor, uh, contractor on the project who also operated the building for the first year. His name was... Uh, Doug Penton, he's awesome, and then the current um, building operator, and we were talking about how the building was operating, and one of the biggest indicators of this building operating efficiently is staying off the boilers. If you're not using too much boilers, then you're really relying on the ground loop and the heat recovery chillers to do very efficient heating and very efficient, well, very efficient heating. And um, the building operator said that, you know, they almost never fire the boilers, so that's 
that was a great indication that the building is still doing great. Um, they still have the main meter data, and I haven't heard anything from them, but um, again, there isn't anything that it allows them to continually monitor it. Okay, and I also want to take a moment to point out to folks that on the lower left below the, um, the slide there, you'll see the uh, second icon is a little down arrow going into a little inbox kind of th looking thing. If you want to have a copy of this presentation, uh, because the website address and the email address that was at the beginning of it and some other interesting uh, data facts to have, uh, you can click on that and download the presentation to your local computer. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave this uh, presentation window uh, up a while after we get off uh, so that people can have a chance to, uh, to download that, whatever they're, they're, um, whatever they're looking at. Um, so um, if I can ask a question to everybody, really, um, and especially anybody who's in the Federal Center South building, is I think because of the plug load story, and that coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they were looking at a lot of different means of, um, you know, shutting off equipment overnight or monitoring plug load equipment, so um, sort of these smart plug strips. And I just wanted to know if you, you guys have seen any of that, if that's um, gone into your offices, and how you guys like it. Because one thing that I'd love to do is go back and look at the plug loads again and look at all the measures that have been integrated at the at Federal Center South to see which measures are, are working best. You know, is it plug load strips or is it just knowing that we need to shut down our computers or is it changes in IT policy? So anyway, that, that's my question. Uh, okay, I believe that uh, Nathan Gre Gregory is, is on. If he can uh, enable your microphone. Uh, I think I see the microphone there. Uh, Gregory, are you there? Hey, Charles. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hey, so um, to my knowledge that uh, IT rule is still in place, that computers need to remain on all night, uh, but they did give us those smart power strips um, where uh, basically our monitors and anything else on our desks is plugged into a a uh, plug that shuts off after, I don't know, like 10 hours automatically, um, so that none of that is drawing any power overnight, but the laptop or the, or the desktop uh, computer itself is actually uh, always on and plugged in so that the IT folks can do whatever it is they do. Um, so that's, that's what I, uh, other than that, I don't know of any other uh, plug load measures that have been taken, but that, that could be some things behind the scenes that I don't know about. Yeah, so one of the th things we did see when we went around and looked at the plug loads was some of the monitors weren't shutting off. Like they, you know how you can program your monitor to shut off after a certain amount of time and, or go into sleep mode, I should say. And for some reason, some of them weren't. Um, and I, I'm not sure. So I think those um, plug strips were there to help shut down the monitors. Um, but I do think the CPUs are probably still churning away overnight um, and, and using some of that plug load energy. Uh, I know that other places have had um, success with the IT departments uh, where they do um, push updates to the, through the network at night uh, that they would include. They'd have everybody still leave their computers on when they go home but they would have in their script routines that did the updating, they would have the uh, the last command would be to tell the computer to shut down. And so the IT department, if they didn't have any scripts to run, they'd just push, push that. Or if they did do an update, they would program the update to automatically shut down the machine uh, once they were done so they weren't running fully until the next morning. I don't know if they're doing that in Seattle yeah. or not. But the other places that we've been doing that. Yeah, that's Maybe great. Some people... people. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm just joking. Go ahead. Okay, so um All right, so does anybody else have any more questions? We have 5 minutes till the hour. Well, so oh, one of the questions, yeah, sorry, one of the questions was what modeling program did we use, HapTrace, 
And so at the time, we used uh, EDSL TAS thermal analysis software, which is a little bit out of date now. Um, now we use IES. We've up upgraded or updated to IES uh, for most of our projects. Um, and then some of our smaller projects, we use um, Train Trace or even HAP, but mostly Train Trace. So we, we tend to not marry ourselves to one analysis software. We want to try and be proficient in different types of energy modeling software because I feel that some software does a better job at certain things and depending on the building um, some software a particular software might be better than another. Um, also I see that somebody asked if the slides would be available uh, made available offline. Um, I assume you mean the video the slides are available uh, to download now um, via that download link that I mentioned on that, if you download those, they have uh, the links on the first two slides there. There was a link to the Unlisted YouTube channel, as well as a link to the uh, what we call the Mercy site, the uh, Sustainability and Energy website. Um, they will have the links to the video uh, once it's available. Once the uh, this webinar is over and I stop the recording, uh, it takes a while for their servers to process it, and so it doesn't show up uh, right away. And sometimes it takes a week or so. And recently, I've been doing, having to do uh, a lot of manual editing. I've been cutting and pasting the slides into the video um, because the way it records was just really low resolution on the video, and, and it has it doubles the width for some reason. But so there's still working kinks out in the video. But um, I would estimate that we can get them online about two weeks following the uh, the webinar. Uh, earlier today, I was I was working on the on the uh, webinar from last week, so. Um, I hope to have that up tomorrow, uh, and uh, so that's that's where we are with that. Uh, so if there's uh, any more questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I don't see any more coming in. Uh, it's uh, 2.58 on my clock, uh, which is uh, run, rounding out the hour. So at this time, I want to thank um, both Nathan and Charles uh, for y'all's time. Uh, this was a great presentation. I certainly, as an architect, like the p beautiful pictures of the building. Um, very well done, and I, I look forward to seeing it one day in person. I saw a little bit uh, of it under construction from a distance, and that was about it. But anyway, I'm going to stop the recording now, and again, as I said, I will leave the uh, the window open so that uh, that people can can make those downloads if they uh, if they want to. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, I'm going to mute my mic, and uh, looks like a lot of People are dropping off and see if uh, giving a lot of people to use it. But thank you guys again. Uh, I think it went pretty well. And uh, thanks for providing also your email address.